Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. You can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. In addition, you can donate to the podcast by going to my website and clicking donate. Just go to Canada ehx.com. Today on the podcast, I have probably one of my biggest interviews and one of my favorite interviews. I'm talking with Peter Mansbridge. From 1988 to 2017, he was the chief correspondent for CBC News and the anchor of The National. We all saw him give us the news for almost two decades, and he's a big part of all of our lives. And he recently released a book called Extraordinary Canadians. And I had a chance to read it, and it's a very inspirational book full of stories of people who were born in Canada, who have come from elsewhere, and have achieved great things. So let's just get to this interview with the legendary Peter Mansbridge. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess first question, uh, how have you been doing with the COVID lockdown and pandemic? (laughs) <laughs> how have we all been doing right we're spending a lot of time indoors um you know we we live in stratford ontario mm-hmm. uh, and we've been pretty lucky in this particular region of the province in terms of the the numbers uh but still you know our lives have all changed we, we live a very different life than we did a year ago we've all had to adapt to that and we've all had to ensure that we care not about ourselves just about ourselves but about those around us uh, and I think we're all uh, we're all managing to do that, with some exceptions. And uh, I think we all recognize too that the challenge is uh, is not over yet. It's going to take a while. Absolutely. Uh, so, what led you to put together the uh, the book? <laughs> well, um, it was actually not my idea. It was uh, it was the idea of Simon and Schuster, the publisher. They came to me about uh, I guess it would be in the early part of the summer of last year, 2019. Uh, with this idea of uh, doing a book that profiled a number of extraordinary Canadians. Um, And that kind of fit exactly with the way uh, that I've often thought. I mean, uh, like you, I've done a lot of interviews. In my case, over 50 years, I've probably done 20,000 interviews. And I've always found that the most interesting people um, are not the celebrities, are not the well-known people, but are actually what we tend to call ordinary people, Mm -hmm. but those who have quite extraordinary stories to tell. And, you know, there's no spin in the way they tell their story. They're not looking for publicity. They they just are who they are. And you end up talking to them and finding their stories quite fascinating. Uh, And so I saw this as an opportunity to do exactly that through this, through this book. Um, I did tell them at that time, early uh, last summer, that I was involved in two major international documentaries and that I was gonna have a hard time meeting their publishing deadline um, because I was gonna be overseas a lot. So uh, I said, I'm, you know, I wanna bring somebody else in on this and have a co-author. And they said, well, you know, we have ghostwriters. And I said, no, 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 I, I don't want a ghostwriter. I want a, a co-author and we'll kind of divide it up. Uh, and so that's when I suggested my, my good friend, Mark Bulgoch, who I've worked with for, you know, most of the last 30 years uh, at the CBC. He was a lineup editor, Simon editor, um, executive producer of various programs that I worked on. Uh, and so, and now retired, like I am in the sense that we're retired, but we're working harder than we did when we were, <laughs> when we were retired. But, uh, so we... Uh, uh, you know, we, uh, he loved the idea of, of doing it, and uh, Simon and Schuster uh, liked the idea as well. So that's how the two of us got involved, and uh, off we went. Um, in reading the stories, they kind of often start off not uh, not great circumstances for a lot of people, but then by the end, these people have overcome a lot of challenges. So, do you feel these inspirational stories are something that we actually need right now, uh, especially you know, not something you could have foreseen uh, a year ago? That's the thing. I, I, I had no idea that we plant this book in the middle of the kind of year that we're having now that never seems to stop with its uh, twists and turns. <laughs> um, but the uh, uh, I, I think a book like this 
is always good for people because it is inspiring on so many different levels, but especially good this year, because I think we, we need to remind ourselves that uh, there are difficulties that we all face. And then there are some individual difficulties uh, where the challenge is met and that we can all learn from it. Uh, and that's what we've, uh, that's what we've got in, in a lot of these stories, because you're absolutely right. They start off, uh, many of them do, with a sense of, oh my gosh, this is going to be a difficult story to read. And then you, 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 through the understanding and learning about the person at the center of the story, you realize, man, I wish I, you know, I wish I had that kind of determination. I wish I had that kind of uh, inspiration to, to tackle a challenge in front of me and then realizing by the end that, you know, maybe I do have that. Uh, and I just haven't shown it before. And so, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, one of the great values of a book like this. Um, in the piece by Cindy Blackstock, uh, she speaks about the racism that she faced as an Indigenous person. Uh, we're obviously more aware of it now, but is racism against Indigenous something that is still kind of too often ignored by, by Canadians? Oh, I think so. You know, I, I often tell the story of when I started in the business in the late 60s, uh, it was in northern Manitoba. I was in Churchill working at a very small radio station. It was like 50 watts or something. <laughs> Couldn't hear it two blocks from the station. But um, the uh, one of the issues that became very evident very quickly to me as somebody who'd moved there from the south I'd come out of a, you know, a privileged background, middle-class uh, Canada, living in Ottawa. And then suddenly I was living in Churchill, Manitoba, um, where it was very much a, a community of, uh, of, of different backgrounds and different cultures. Uh, and racism was absolutely evident, like where we went. So I saw this for, you know, three years. And one of the you know, one of the things that I've found myself doing when I interview, uh, whether they're Indigenous leaders or non-Indigenous leaders, about the issue of racism in Canada, I say to them, you know, when I started in the business in the late 1960s, I found myself asking the questions of people like you that I'm still asking today. We're still confronted. Now, have there been advancements and changes? Absolutely. And, you know, many for the good, but we're still a long way from it. And, you know, that's what the Murray Sinclair uh, Commission was all about, uh, looking at the, uh, uh, you know, what in fact was kind of the, the, the issue of racism in Canada through residential schools, through the murdered and missing women and children and girls um, in the Indigenous community. So, uh, you know, some, so many of those questions still linger. Cindy Blackstock, you know, there are 17 people in this book. And, you know, I'm not going to go through all their stories or <laughs> no reason to buy the book. But with the, with most of these 17 people, uh, neither Mark nor I had ever met before um, and didn't know anything about. It. Some of them we did. Cindy Blackstock, in my case, I, I knew about Cindy because I interviewed her about five years ago in one of the stages of her big uh, legal challenge uh, in one of the uh, major courts in Canada about um, the uh, discrimination for Indigenous kids compared with non-Indigenous kids in the, within the school system. And so um, I'd met her before, and when I'd met her, I thought, this person's really interesting. I want to know kind of more about her. And so when I started doing this book, I thought right away uh, of Cindy Blackstock. I got to talk to her. So I uh, I, I contacted her and we got into a series of discussions and, uh, and it certainly broadened my understanding of, of kind of who she is and where she comes from on this issue. Because when she starts talking, as, uh, as you saw, uh, Craig, in the book, about her first years, her early years with a Indigenous uh, father and a non-Indigenous mother, and the different way she was treated depending on which parent she was with, um, struck to the very heart of this issue of, uh, of racism within within Canada. And watching it through the eyes of what was at that time was a three or four year old kid, um, trying to make sense of it all and trying to understand why 
why it was different, why she was being treated differently. Um, it, w- it was quite, you know, gripping, quite, uh, quite, uh, uh, quite the story. And then led through her what has been a, a remarkable uh, life to this point, and will only obviously continue to be so. Mm-hmm. Uh, one common theme through some of the stories is somebody coming from elsewhere uh, in the world and coming to Canada and finding success. And Francis Wright was kind of a really good example of that in the book. So what makes Canada kind of a place that a lot of people do want to come to? Um, it's not perfect, but, you know, they do want to come here for, for a better life. You got that right. It's not perfect. And that's one of the things this book does and signals to you that, you know, as, as, as wonderful and as inspirational as these stories are, they are actually stories about uh, people who have to face challenges within our country to try and make life better, not just for themselves, but for others in similar kinds of situations. So it's constantly reminding us of the challenges that are still ahead. Uh, for what is a great country like ours. Uh, you know, why do people come here? Because of the opportunity. You know, because we're young, we're dynamic. We, there are lots of opportunities within our country. And, you know, we, when you travel the world, as, as I've done, and I imagine you've done a bit as well, when you tell people, hey, I'm from Canada, I'm a Canadian, they look at you like, oh boy, you're so lucky. And we are lucky, you know, and we tend to forget that at times that we're lucky. Take a person like, like Francis Wright, who I've, um, you know, I think I first met when I was covering the, um, uh, the famous five statue being placed in Ottawa, uh, which is, a, you know, a tribute obviously to, to women who had made such a difference in, in our country and the ability uh, of women to do things they'd never been allowed to do before. Um, sh- she struck me immediately as somebody who was focused, who wanted to achieve a goal, who was convinced she knew how to do it and that she could do it uh, in a way where she would create more friends and more influence, not less. And, uh, you know, and and she's never stopped. I mean, obviously uh, the uh, women's issue has been huge on, on her, uh, on her radar, but, you know, like two years ago, she called me up two or three years ago, she called me up and she said, you know, Peter, I, I'm wondering if you'd come out to Calgary, where, where she lives, um, to give a speech to a noon hour group where I'm trying to raise money for the cause of, and I'm thinking, okay, it's going to be another cause about women. But she said, no, this cause is about abuse of men. And I thought, wow, this woman, <laughs> you can't stop her. She's like amazing. She's always thinking of trying of ways to try and make life better for those uh, around her. Um, and, you know, I went out, and I, you know, I, I did the speech and she was extremely grateful, but, uh, you, you know, she's just a, she's just like all of the others in this book uh, is a remarkable person. And as you will have noticed, I mean, the, the people in this book are, are all very different. I mean, we, we, one of the goals that Mark and I had right from the get go was we want this book to, reflect the diversity of our country in a lot of different ways, whether it's geographically, whether it's gender wise, whether it's culture wise, whether it's um, by profession, whatever. And so what you've got here is 17 people, very different people who uh, have all made a mark in different areas uh, of the country, but all they're all marks that we can all learn from. And, uh, and, and, and that was the uh, one of the, the more enjoyable factors of this book. Uh, the story of Susan Rose was especially kind of shocking uh, because we've made a lot of headway in the past 20 years with uh, LGBTQ, but uh, do we still have a long way to go for inclusion and acceptance, which is something that her story had a lot of, uh, especially being a teacher? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, in many of the areas in this book, it's an indication of how we still have a long way to go on certain areas. It could be an area as traditional and historic as the issue of uh, the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Canadians, or it could be an issue that seems for most Canadians to be much more recent, and that's uh, the various issues surrounding LGBTQ. Um, You know, if, if you'd raise this issue 10 years ago, 
most people wouldn't know what you were talking about. They wouldn't have been able to define those initials. Um, today, it's much more obvious to most Canadians, but the issues are still not completely resolved. And perhaps not surprisingly, I think we, we have a much more inclusive attitude in this country now in a lot of areas, but we still, we still got ways to go. And you can see that uh, on the way, you know, some Canadians react to stories like this. Uh, so to answer your question, basically, absolutely. We still have a long way to go and people like Susan Rose are helping us get there. Um, like I said, I don't want to go through all 17 people. So kind of the last person I'll touch on uh, was one of my favorite stories. It was Jessica Grossman. And I know for me, you know, if my internet goes out, it's, you know, this is the worst thing that can possibly happen. But, you know, here's this girl who's spent her, almost her entire childhood dealing with horrible pain and surgery, and she overcomes all of that. And so reading stories such as hers, do you feel like people will find their own ways to overcome their own adversaries using people like her as an example? I hope so, because hers is a great example. Um, you know, Mark wrote that story and uh, my co-author, Mark Bogich. And, uh, and, you know, I've never asked him directly, but I'm assuming that one of the reasons he was fascinated by Susan's story was that he himself um, has spent most of his life dealing with the impact of Crohn's disease, which is the major issue uh, that, uh, that faced um, uh, uh, Jessica. Jessica. Um, but, um, you know, I think her story, you know, can, you don't have to have Crohn's disease to be impacted by her story. You just have to have a challenge. And to understand that there are people who've met challenges with much more severe difficulties than most of us will ever face. Um, and they, they've met those challenges head on. Um, and we can draw inspiration from, from the way they've done it. Um, but I also think that connecting it back to your earlier story about Francis Wright uh, is that, you know, people come to Canada because of opportunity. Um, in Canada, sometimes those of us who've grown up here don't appreciate that as much as perhaps we should. Um, but in, in facing these challenges that many of them have done. Um, in the end, what's the main message that you want to get out to people through the book? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I, I think the main message is that we're a country of, you know, my dad used to say to me, he was a, a public servant. He's, he, he's passed uh, now for a number of, you know, more than 10 years. But he was a senior public servant, did extremely well in both the Canadian government and the Alberta government. He used to say to me as I was growing up, when we moved to Canada, we moved from, uh, we came from Britain, and we'd sit around the dining room table, my sister and I and my little brother, and he'd, he'd pull out a map or he'd look at a map of Canada and he said, he'd say, this is such an enormous country that when you look at it and you recognize the diversity of it, just simply in geography and resources, um, it almost appears to be ungovernable. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people around the world might look at it that way, but we chose to make it governable uh, in the sense of joining together, joining forces or the tensions there always are in a big country like ours. But we take inspiration and lessons from the kind of people who are in this book about how to confront challenge, how to face challenge um, for the common good, not just their own personal good. And I think that's what's uh, perhaps behind the, uh, the secret of, uh, of this book. That one, we're a pretty special country. We're a pretty lucky country, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't all happen automatically. As John Turner, who we just buried a few weeks ago, used to say, you know, democracy doesn't ha happen by accident. You got to participate. Mm -hmm. uh, and part of that participation is the kind of stories that are, that are, that are dotted through this book that, uh, that, that, that the people have met challenges in a way that we can draw inspiration from and meet the challenges that confront us. They may be small, small in comparison, certainly to some of these stories. Uh, but there's still challenges nonetheless. 
Absolutely. And then just my last question, uh, it's kind of hard to say, especially with 2020 being the way it is, but what's coming up for you as we move into 2021? Um, I don't know, quite frankly. I, uh, you know, I've still got these documentaries that I do, but the problem is with COVID, you can't travel. Mm -hmm. So I've had to put stuff on the shelf. I started doing a daily podcast, not quite the excitement level of yours with your fancy <laughs> background. <laughs> but the um, uh, but I started doing this uh, nightly podcast because of COVID back in March, thinking that oh you know it'll be a month, six weeks, or whatever, and then we'll be moving on. Here I am, whatever it is, 34, 35 weeks later, uh, still doing it. Now lucked in with having another crazy story in the sense of the U.S. election to uh, to play with as well. Um, but I've actually really enjoyed doing it, and I've had a number of approaches. Uh, on the part of those who would like to sponsor or buy the distribution rights for, for my uh, podcast. Um, so I've got to think seriously about that because right now, probably a little bit like you, I do it out of my home. I do it out of my office. It's all very sort of kind of Mickey Mouse, really. <laughs> I don't have a fancy microphone like you do, but I, but you know, it's fun to do. And I'm sure you find it fun to do as well. And uh, so I will, uh, I will, um, you know, give that some thought as well. Another book, entirely possible. I might do that. Um, I give a lot of speeches. I sit on five boards. So I'm still busy. <laughs> as I said, <laughs> I said earlier, I think that I find myself at times as busy as I was when I was hosting <laughs> the national. Um, there are days when I think, oh my gosh, why couldn't I be just be doing the national again? It's so much easier. <laughs> but, uh, but it's all fun. Life is good. I hope you enjoyed that interview with Peter Mansbridge. And if you did, please leave a rating and review. You can reach me at Craig at Canada EHX.com. You can visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history, as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to Canada EHX.com. And again, you can support the podcast for $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. Just like all of these wonderful people have. Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Chauve, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., Vic Hedges, J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, Spencer M., and Iris Gray. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.